Uh, very good afternoon, uh, friends. Uh, my name is uh, Leong Nguyen Yun from the University Tunku Abdul Rahman in Malaysia, and I was formerly with the uh, Institute of Strategic and International Studies, uh, ISIS uh, Malaysia. Uh, the topic, general topic on China, uh, China relations with major powers. We've had some very interesting discussions. Uh, coming from Southeast Asia, from ASEAN, uh, I'm indeed very pleased to see that there is a session on China and ASEAN. And we have, from ASEAN, a total of three, uh, two other colleagues from Vietnam and Myanmar, and also someone from uh, Australia, and Singapore, China, for that matter, <laughs> indeed. And uh, when we look at very brief comments, when we look back at China-ASEAN relations, uh, I have to say, and I, many would agree with me, that they have come a long way compared to the early period, the Cold War period, the Mao Zedong period, uh, where relationships were very negative. And it took the part of small countries, ASEAN, living under the shadow of a big country like China, to really think out of the box. And I must say in this respect, uh, Malaysia did quite positively, because we felt that there was a way, there's a need to come to terms with China, no matter what, despite ideological differences. There's no reason why we cannot work together. And we applied this principle uh, also with Vietnam when Southeast Asia was divided. And now, as you know, for past ooh, over a decade now, uh, Vietnam and the Indo-Chinese states have also joined ASEAN. From the perspective of small countries, we constantly have to be creative in our thinking uh, with the major powers. On the part of China, China has been very positive towards uh, uh, ASEAN, especially since the 90s and 20s, the last two decades. A slew of agreements uh, showing cooperation uh, on both sides. China, uh, ASEAN, uh, free trade agreement, and also the strategic, uh, China-ASEAN strategic uh, pact for prosperity and peace, and signing of the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. But recently, because of very pressing issues, and all of you are aware it's South China Sea issue, uh, this is now a, a test for ASEAN and China. Uh, we have taken for granted to some extent in the earlier period, but at the same time, in the background, we know that sooner or later, problems might arise, and it has come now. And the part of uh, China, China's image, I think, is being tested vis-a-vis -vis its relations uh, with the small countries. And the part of ASEAN, because of this relationship, among ASEAN members, uh, there are differences in their thinking. And this has given rise to questions some reservations about uh, can ASEAN unity continue to hold, or is this the beginning of ASEAN unraveling some, some appeal, or is it possible for ASEAN to overcome this? Okay. We have five uh, for presenters here on our panel, uh, others have four, but we have five. So we have to be very careful about time, uh, five to six minutes. And uh, I would like to begin. I won't introduce their bio uh, data and so on. You can read about them. Huh? Uh, for the first speaker would be Professor Huang Jing uh, from the National University of Singapore. Uh, time limit, five to seven. Okay. And uh, so kindly adhere to this so that we will have more time for Q&A afterwards. Please, Professor Huang. Yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me here to talk about China and ASEAN. 
we have to have an overall understanding of the regional situation here. That is the situation in Asian Pacific because both China and ASEAN is members in this region. To understand the situation here, I think two words. Number one is the integration, and number two is the uncertainty. Integration is easy because the biggest consequence of globalization and development in the region is that entire Asian Pacific has been irrevocably irrevocably integrated into one. And uh, it is revocable because this economic integration was not driven by any policies. It's driven by market forces. And uh, China and ASEAN both are benefit beneficiaries tremendously from this integration. In that part, China and ASEAN get more and more into each other, so-called interdependence. Uncertainty is a little bit uh, complicated. The first and foremost, of course, about uncertainty is that all the major powers, including ASEAN as one, are in a transition period. Nobody knows how China will look like five or ten years from now. Nobody knows how Japan will look like ten years now. United States the same, ASEAN the same. So when everyone is in a transition period, that creates uncertainty. And the secondly, is that uh, just about five, ten years ago, United States is the dominant power in the region, both economically and politically. So every country only have a plan A. Every country in the region, inclu including China, have to use one yardstick to measure the, the national policy and national interest. That yardstick is the United States of America. But in the past 10 years, things changed. The United States is still dominant in security arrangements, but economically, we have another center, that is China. So as a result, every country in this region has to use two yardsticks to measure the national policy and national interests, the United States and the China. As, re as a result, Everybody is hedging, including the United States, including China. Of course, ASEAN is a big player in the hedging game. Yeah. Everybody has a plan B now, not just plan A, and that's uncertainty. Last but not the least related to this is that the cornerstone for regional peace and stability ever since 1945 is the U.S.-Japan alliance or us Rock alliance. That is the foundation for peace and stability in the region, and everybody has been taking a free ride, including China. But the problem is that these alliances are created, were created in the Cold War period. It created for commitment, or containment, I'm sorry, for containment, not for integration. By nature, it is exclusive, not inclusive. But as China's rising higher and higher, becomes stronger and stronger, this security arrangement based on US alliance system cannot and will not compensate China's legitimate security interests. Then we have a problem. We have a number one major power who is a number one trade partner for everyone, including Japan, and not really included into the security arrangements. And that's another source of uncertainty. Given all of this, ASEAN and, United, and China have similar dilemmas. For the ASEAN, the two, integrate, integration is a way to go. There's no way that ASEAN can get away from this orbit of China-centered economic orbit. On the other hand, ASEAN have two dilemmas related to each other. Number one, of course, should ASEAN take side? Because Obama's administration has returned to Asia. The first is said the United States will have to return to Asia, and that return was, is not really appropriate, so change to pivot. But you can pivot in, you can pivot out. It's not good. Now they use rebalancing. Rebalancing whom? Obviously rebalancing China. So. That's why ASEAN is in a kind of dilemma. Should ASEAN take side? Obviously, ASEAN will not take side. And second dilemma, of course, is South China Sea. Four members of ASEAN are claimant countries. So ASEAN does not want to take side either. But however, it's right within the ASEAN. ASEAN is powerful, is useful, is important, exactly because ASEAN are united as one. So if ASEAN is divided, it's not really meaningful for the region. But on the other hand, if you look at China's problem, it's the same. On the one hand, ASEAN want to use, no, China want to use ASEAN as a buffer zone because neutrality and pragmatism is a fundamental principle of ASEAN. Because of that, China found it extremely useful to buffer China's tension with the United States or with India and with other powers. So by that logic, the more united ASEAN is, the stronger ASEAN is, the more effective this buffer can be. But on the other hand, China's own behavior, the pressure on ASEAN, is divide ASEAN in an unprecedented manner 
for example, for the first time in ASEAN history, it failed to reach a joint statement last July. I think China overplayed its hand, and China realized its mistake, but how to address it? That's the first issue about ASEAN. And secondly, I think for ASEAN also comes to a historical moment that ASEAN have to take some new direction. In other words, ASEAN in the crossway. Because 10 years ago, United States are too strong, too dominant, and too confident to worry that ASEAN is not taking a neutral position. And China is too weak and too intimidated to not to appreciate ASEAN's neutrality. But now, United States and China are getting more and more on an equal footing in the region. So therefore, neutrality may not serve ASEAN's best interest as before. So for the first time, ASEAN may be forced to cast out its own ground, its own independence ground. By doing that, ASEAN has two problems. Problem number one, how you can unite 10 countries all together for a ground you can hold on to when you're dealing with the United States or China or other Asian powers. And number two, of course, when you want to do that, you need a leadership. And the problem is that ASEAN never has a real leader. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Our next speaker, uh, Li Jianwei, please. And uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just now, the Chair and also uh, uh, our first speaker, uh, Professor Huang, mentioned uh, the South China Sea. Uh, as some scholars uh, commented, South China Sea, uh, the dispute over the uh, insular features is not a big issue um, between ASEAN countries, particularly disputants, four disputants in ASEAN and China, but it is a testing stone for China and for ASEAN. So coming from the uh, National Institute for South China Sea Studies, uh, with South China Sea as a starting point for our research, uh, my talk will be uh, China-ASEAN in relation to the management of the South China Sea dispute. As just now mentioned, uh, uh, we know four ASEAN uh, member states, namely Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Philippines are directly involved in the South China Sea dispute, uh, in which five states, adding China, and uh, six parties, adding Taiwan, having overlapping claims to insular features in Nansha Islands, the Spratlys in English, and also all having overlapping uh, maritime claims. And. Uh, since four members, four of ASEAN's members involved in this, what role can ASEAN play in this uh, is of uh, interest. And how ASEAN has interacted, I will talk about this in three points. And since my, uh, my supervisor when I was in school always say, talk about issue no more than three points. So my first point is uh, how ASEAN have interacted with uh, its own members in this issue and interact with China. And also three points. Since the 1990s, ASEAN has uh, sought to pursue a proactive role in uh, response to the developments in the South China Sea. So ASEAN has done it through three uh, channels. The first is its own statements and the declarations. The most important is the 1992 Declaration on the South China Sea. This emphasized on peaceful means in solving their disputes and without resort to the use of force. And the second point, it emphasized of self-restraint. Later on is a statement and declarations repeated these uh, principles and also added uh, keeping peace and stability in the region is key. The second channel is uh, through ASEAN-China dialogue uh, to, uh, it's worth mentioning in the very beginning is China ASEAN dialogue. The, over, uh, the, overall, the overall role, the objective is to deal with overall in relations, overall relations between ASEAN and China. And later on, gradually, South China Sea was put on the schedule. And, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, during the discussions, uh, ASEAN countries and, and China come to uh, an uh, agreement, that is the declaration of uh, parties, uh, a declaration of conduct uh, of the parties in the South China Sea in 2002. <coughs> and uh, last year in July, they also come to an agreement on the guidelines for implementing uh, this uh, DOC. And also uh, now talks and are growing between China and ASEAN for uh, a COC, that's a code of conduct. 
And the third channel is uh, ASEAN involved, uh, ASEAN deal with this issue is uh, through ASEAN Regional Forum. And the second point I want to discuss is uh, chi how China interacts with ASEAN in managing the South China Sea issue. And uh, ch for Chinese perspective, uh, ASEAN is not a claiming state to the uh, dispute. ASEAN, but ASEAN has a stake, stake in the South China Sea dispute, that is to keep peace and stability in the South China Sea region and beyond. And second is promote confidence to uh, diffuse the tension and, uh, and uh, managing the dispute. And the third point is uh, assessing ASEAN's uh, possibilities to influence the development. Uh, the spreadly dispute uh, situation and overall South China Sea situation is challenging to ASEAN internally and also in its uh, uh, foreign relations. ASEAN is not intended uh, formally to, uh, to act as a mediator and uh, it is a vehicle to promote uh, confidence, promote confidence uh, among its uh, members and also promote confidence to uh, provide uh, effective dialogue with China to diffuse tension and manage the South China Sea dispute. Also from the ASEAN perspective, the aim of its policy towards the South China Sea is to promote confidence and contribute to the non-escalation of the dispute situation. That is clearly stated in this uh, 2009 ASEAN Political Security Community blue Blueprint. And one of the major problems is for ASEAN is to how to respond to the periods of tensions in the South China Sea. How to, the challenge is how to balance ASEAN solidarity, which is key for ASEAN survival, and with the overall relationship with China, which is also of great importance to, to ASEAN economically and geostrategically. So the conclusion is for China and ASEAN, they must strengthen the existing mechanism, that is through track one, implementing the DOC, and through track two or track 1.5, as you main, mentioned, to promote understanding and confidence. And beyond this, also to promote a uh, mechanism such as uh, COC to encompass guidelines for self-restraint, cooperation, and application of the international law, including UNCLOS. Thank you. That's my. Thank you thank very you. much indeed. And uh, moving on to our third uh, presenter, Ambassador Myun Mong Shen uh, from Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Studies. Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to talk about this ASEAN-China relations, in particular with relevance to my country, because as you all know, my country has uh, undergone uh, significant political and economic reforms since uh, 2011, when the new government of, uh, of President Deng Xiaoping was installed. As you all know, in ASEAN-China relations, we have a long uh, history, starting with the dialogue partnership which was established in 1991. Now, ASEAN enjoys strategic partnership with China. China has also very much deeply penetrated politically, economically, and socially in its relations with uh, ASEAN. And uh, Myanmar is, as the, is at the crossroads of India, China, and Southeast Asia. Therefore, we provide physical connectivity between India, China, and with the ASEAN countries. Uh, Myanmar and China had had very good relations since ancient times. After 1988, however, since the Western countries ostracized Myanmar for suppressing the democracy movement in those times and human rights violations, uh, China filled in the vacuum left by the Western countries. And China has supported Myanmar diplomatically, politically, economically, and militarily. And now in Myanmar, the Chinese investment is the number one, amounting up to about US dollar, 15 billion. And with border trade with China, we have about $5 billion annually. Since, however, March 2011, the new government has already 
good relations and rapprochement with the U.S. and with the EU. China supports publicly in its um, in Myanmar's news relations with the U.S. and EU. But in reality, I think China has concerns that the Myanmar has now opened up to the U.S. and the EU, both in terms of uh, economy and uh, political dimensions. Uh, but uh, we have allayed the concerns of China that to, uh, China must be competitive also in our country, so that uh, because we Myanmar, in its own interest, has also to find partners beyond our region. And of course, there was the President Obama's high-profile visit to Myanmar very recently, and that indicates, I think, the U.S. strategy to involve all the ASEAN member states in its uh, pivotal shift to the Asia-Pacific region. And now uh, I would like to touch briefly upon the South China issue, which my colleague from China has just uh, explained. And uh, as you all know, at the summit in November in Phnom Penh, uh, because of this issue, the unity of ASEAN has come into question. And uh, we, would like, we would not like to have a bit of the same uh, so, uh, as you all know, that uh, Myanmar will be chairing the ASEAN uh, summit in 2014. Uh, we are a little also concerned about this issue because, we, as a non claimant, we would like to facilitate both uh, in China's interest and also for the other claimant countries' interest on this issue. And uh, I'm very much just now pleased to learn that uh, our Chinese colleague has said uh, now uh, we are going into discussions, maybe substantive, on the COC, which will be the guidelines for uh, the conduct in, the, in this uh, dispute. And of course, uh, you know, we all want, ASEAN wants to see uh, peace and prosperity with, with China. It's not a confrontation like that. But... Uh, before Myanmar chairs this uh, session in 2014, I hope uh, some developments regarding the drafting of COC will come about. And also maybe in ASEAN we are thinking about uh, uh, having an EPG, uh, eminent persons group, so that along the, this line also we can try to find some uh, solutions or, to this problem. I, I would like to stop it here. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sen. Our next presenter from uh, Australia, uh, Professor Carl Thayer from New South Wales, not university. Yeah? Thank you, Stephen. I'm looking at uh, the question of ASEAN and its economic relations with China and how it can manage that, plus the security relations over the South China Sea. I'll begin that ASEAN has been instrumental in, in promoting new regional security and economic architecture the ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Plus Three, the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Plus, and this year the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RECEP. ASEAN insists on its centrality in the these multilateral mechanisms and also insists on the acceptance of ASEAN norms, the ASEAN way, to govern decision making. Now the rise of China and China's challenge to, to US primacy in East Asia has emerged as the single most important challenge to ASEAN centrality in Southeast Asia economic and security affairs. And ASEAN members are divided over how to pursue both economic and security goals. And this division provides opportunities for the intrusion of great power rivalry. So if you look at ASEAN and economic regionalism, uh, we have the 1997 financial crisis and the formation of the ASEAN plus three, an exclusivist East Asian arrangement. We then have China ASEAN free trade area with the advanced economies agreeing already by 2010, the least developed, uh, to catch up by 2015. And then ASEAN has itself has negoti negotiated free trade areas with five states, South Korea, Japan, India, Australia, and New Zealand. And finally, as it aims towards an economic community by 2015, it hopes to become a unified market and production area by then and to leverage its dealings with China and the United States if it can maintain its unity and create such a, a zone. 
Now, the Obama administration has altered the dynamics through its promotion of a trans-Pacific partnership. This was originally set up by Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore, later joined or later under consideration by Australia, Canada, Malaysia, Mexico, and Peru. In 2012, ASEAN launched, as I mentioned, its own regional comprehensive economic partnership, and there's great power differences between these two. The U.S. TPP excludes, does not yet include China, and the RECEP, the regional one, does not include the United States. The idea of the regional comprehensive economic partnership is to harmonize the existing free trade agreements that I mentioned between ASEAN and other states. It's a low-end deal. The U.S. is setting standards well above what would normally be required. So as ASEAN edges closer to the creation of an ASEAN community, its members are divided as to which of these two regional bodies to pursue, RECEP or the TPP. Um, and if, uh, I said that the, the ASEAN promotions fall short of the standards the U.S. would like to see incorporated, and, and the U.S.-China rivalry stands behind both these mechanisms and could prove divisive to ASEAN members. Now, if I turn to regional security, ASEAN is also deeply divided about how to manage territorial disputes between China and Vietnam and the Philippines. Uh, a key starting point, although it began much earlier, is China's tabling of its U-shaped map, which draws lines in the water and its assertion of sovereignty over that. Then ASEAN and China in 2011 adopted uh, guidelines to implement the DOC, and so far those have got have little beyond the, the, the talking stage and identifying project. This was supposed to be the first start of a, a code of conduct. Now, we know that diplomatic uh, progress on the COC stalled as a result of the contretemps at the 45th ASEAN ministerial meeting. Indonesia attempted to recover the unity through its getting agreement, unanimous agreement in ASEAN on six fundamental principles. But China has withheld, and, until I'm corrected, that until conditions are ripe um, and the attitude of certain countries does not conform to the DOC spirit, there will be no discussions on the COC. Now, ASEAN, I think, is divided into three sets of countries. The mainland states of Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. The literal states, those that make claims, the four, Vietnam, Philippines, to, and then subdivided Malaysia and Brunei. And then the maritime states, Indonesia and Singapore. The mainland states, with the exception of Cambodia, are differential to China and also want to engage in very low-key diplomacy. They support ASEAN unity. It's not a central thing. Uh, exception, Cambodia has found it in its own interest to advance China's position. It's a question of patron-client relationships, I think. The Vietnam and the Philippines are rather frontline. Malaysia and Brunei support ASEAN unity, but have kept, uh, kept from making their, their policies known uh, in public uh, itself. Um, if we look at the operation, there's five states, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, who form a loose coalition trying to get a, a unified ASEAN position and promoting its affairs uh, towards China. Now, I was also asked to address what China's new leadership is likely to do, and I said, we know, I think, from Xi Jinping's speech to the Nanning ASEAN Expo, uh, but when he was vice president, that China will pursue economic integration with ASEAN through the, the existing ASEAN free trade area and the ASEAN plus three mechanisms and through the regional cooperative economic program. She outlined four, a four-point program to further enhance relations with ASEAN to increase bilateral trade from $326 billion last year to $500 billion, to encourage Chinese uh, companies to invest in ASEAN, to promote transportation connectivity on land and sea between China and ASEAN and promote astoundingly people-to-people -people ties uh, with a goal of 100,000 exchanges of people, students and youth, over a 10-year period, nominally 1,000 from each ASEAN country. Uh, uh, Brunei and Laos, I think they'd be hard-pressed, but anyway, we'll, we'll, Indonesia could make that up. Okay. China new leadership will inherit entrenched policy in the South China Sea, and they're going to find it increasingly difficult to manage the competing bureaucracies and domestic nationalism uh, that give play to these issues. China under Xi Jinping will not seek a direct confrontation with the United States over the South China Sea. Rather, he is likely to engage the U.S. with the aim of moderating its high-profile stance 
in return for Chinese diplomatic engagement with ASEAN over a COC. Uh, China's new leadership can be expected to manage Chinese issues by reacting strongly, massive retaliation was used, my word was react strongly, to any challenge to China's indisputable sovereignty. Now, Vice Foreign Minister Fu Ying has made quite clear to the Philippines they're not leaving Scarborough Shoal, so they've occupied it and virtually annexed it. They have their boats there, they're not going home, and there's nothing that the Philippines can do. They've also instructed the Philippines not to internationalize the issue. Do not discuss this issue with your allies, the United States. Do not take this issue to the United Nations, and do not hold press conferences and put this issue in public. So a very strong point against a very weak country. Now, if we look at the action by Hanan province authorities in issuing new regulations on boarding vessels engaged in illegal activities in Chinese territorial sea, uh, we, we now have a statement by uh, Li Jianwei's boss, Wu Shijun, from, from the Institute, but also the External Affairs Department, uh, that it's aimed at Vietnamese fishing craft. So Chinese new leadership, to conclude... Um, will engage ASEAN senior officials on implementing cooperative projects under the DOC, while at the same time, I would argue, proactively quarantining any discussion on a COC. ASEAN diplomats put it off into 2015. It will play on internal differences with ASEAN by offering the carrot of Chinese assistance and funds for DOC confidence-building projects, and will offer the stick of diplomatic pressure and intimidation by its paramilitary vessels, fishing fleets, to oppose any alteration to the status quo. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Our last uh, presenter, Dr. Huang Antoine from the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Please, Huang. Well, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, first of all, I would like to speak about the golden period of the relationship between ASEAN and China you know, from early 1990s you know, up to uh, the end of 2000, uh, around 2008. So you see that you know, after the Tiananmen incident in 1989, there was a bad relationship between China and the West, and China you know, was embargoed economically and politically you know, by uh, the West. And ASEAN was then served as a gateway for China to the outside world. And ASEAN also embraced you know, China's willingness to develop relations with ASEAN. And during that period, we saw the signing of the strategic partnership between China and ASEAN. And we saw the dramatic development of the relation between ASEAN and China you know, for nearly two decades from uh, early 1990s up to uh, uh, the end of 2000. So we, uh, ASEAN you know, served uh, uh, as a spokesman for China's uh, uh, peace-loving policy and I think you know, there was also some mistakes. Now you know, they see that there was a mistake from ASEAN you know, to speak uh, too much about you know, the peace-loving uh, policies of China. But after 2008, we saw you know, a different China. China you know, took um, not a charm offensive you know, towards the ASEAN countries. We saw some assertive needs you know, from uh, China's uh, policies towards the ASEAN countries. And that makes you know, the ASEAN countries feel a bit scared, a bit you know, concerned about you know, uh, what China's next move you know, in its relations with ASEAN in uh, preserving the peace and security environment in the region. So we see that you know, the South China Sea issue is a big problem you know, in ASEAN-China relations. Although, you know, the Chinese leaders, when they talk to the ASEAN countries, they say that, you know, this is a small thing. And when we talk about the Sino-ASEAN relation, we should not talk about the South China Sea issue. We need to see, you know, a grand picture in the relations, and South China Sea is just a small thing. But if you make a comparison, you know, between the South China Sea issue and the uh, <coughs> Utah dispute between China and Japan, China would not, you know, let the issue go. And, but you could by no way you know, compare the deal you tie dispute between China and Japan you know, with what China have claimed you know, in the South China Sea. Eighty percent you know, of the area of South China Sea you know, has now been claimed to China. And it's, or the claims you know, by China in the South China Sea does not base you know, on 
uh, the international law. So I think you know, there are many documents that show about that. And uh, China has never had effective control in the area within the U-shaped line. And what China has been doing you know, has made ASEAN become very much worried. I have attended you know, so many ASEAN-China conferences you know, over the past few years in China, in ASEAN countries. And even you know, during the discussions when we talk about the future relationship of China and ASEAN, or two-thirds at least you know, of the discussion has been covered by the South China Sea issue, by the security in the region. So I think the situation you know, in Sino-ASEAN relations in the next 20 years you know, is very much different from what we see in the past 20 years. So if China and ASEAN is not uh, able to find a, a solution uh, to the South China Sea issue, uh, that would damage the future of the relations between China and ASEAN. So we see that on the one hand, China has really, has indeed wanted to improve relations with ASEAN, and we see that sincerity from China's side. But on the other hand, because of the South China Sea, so China's image, China's uh, 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 goodwill you know, has been tarnished uh, in the region, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, and in the world as well. So I think that you know, the other countries outside the region has now uh, began looking at China you know, with some suspicions you know, of the intentions. So I think that you know, by one way or another, this needs to be managed you know, uh, between China and ASEAN. So I think that you know, as a bigger country that lives next you know, to a group of small and medium-sized countries, China needs you know, to take into consideration the concerns of the small and medium-sized countries in you know, Southeast Asia. So I think there are three things you know, that China needs to take into consideration. Psychologically, you know, when small and medium-sized countries you know, live next to bigger neighbors, it doesn't matter you know, whether the big neighbor is good or bad, but there has always been some concern from the small and medium-sized countries you know, towards the bigger neighbor. So you can see the relations you know, between uh, India's smaller neighbors you know, in South Asia, uh, Russia's smaller neighbors you know, towards Russia. So there is you know, uh, legitimate concerns from ASEAN countries you know, towards China. If you also take into account the widening gap in uh, power between China and ASEAN, there is also more reasons you know, for concerns from the ASEAN side. Uh, the second issue is the historical... Uh, one minute? One minute. Uh, the historical factor in the relationship between China and ASEAN. So we see that you know, the relations between China and ASEAN has just been mended not long time ago, you know, about 20 years ago, when the two sides you know, signed the strategic partnership. So there is also a uh, need to be done from the two sides to uh, cement the partnership. And the other issue you know, is uh, China's recent actions you know, in the South China Sea that makes the ASEAN mm -hmm. countries you know, have become worried. I also have uh, some other issues, but I will you know, talk to that during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, friends, we've had uh, five uh, interesting presentations uh, on China and ASEAN, uh, particularly focusing on South uh, China Sea. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a Filipino uh, representative here, uh, because I'm sure you are aware that his views are more similar to the Vietnamese view, uh, that uh, China perhaps uh, has been uh, too assertive uh, on the South China Sea and rather concerned about this. Okay? And uh, ASEAN, as you know, we have prided ourselves on uh, neutrality, centrality, and so on. Uh, if I may just ask uh, Professor Huang, uh, did I hear you right when you said that perhaps given the circumstances now mm -hmm. uh, that ASEAN is facing, perhaps uh, it's not sure. possible to be neutral anymore? Could you elaborate on that? I don't mean it's impossible. Yeah. I mean it's more and more difficult. Uh, not only because the problem within ASEAN, for example, South China Sea issue, uh, could very much divide ASEAN. The best example is that just one country's uh, opposition ASEAN was not able to 
produce a joint statement and also other issues. But I think another issue, like I said before, is that as United States and China more and more become uh, competi uh, strategic competitors, I don't want to use enemy rivalries. And especially as China is rising so rapidly, the, the situation is no longer one-sided. The both sides have equal fo uh, footing. Then uh, neutrality is more difficult uh, because now both sides want ASEAN to be on its side. So if ASEAN to avoid this kind of situation, in my view, I think the long term ASEAN will have first time in history have to work out its own ground, independent ground. ASEAN works for ASEAN, not for neutrality, <laughs> not for the middle way. By doing that, like I said, then ASEAN will have a leadership, which is a challenge in the first place. And second is that what is ASEAN's ground? On many, many issues, that uh, that's, will be very challenging. So I think that uh, because of the dramatic change, the, 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 sh the irrevocable shift of a strategic balance in the region, now uh, Russia's uh, so-called ASEAN way, that is being neutral, being pragmatic, is more and more difficult to to practice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, would any of the panelists want to ask a question uh, to the other panelists? Oh, we or will open? We'll, or we'll just open it up to, uh, to the audience, yeah? Okay, please. One <coughs> first here, and I see the second hand, and the third one over there, yeah? And then we will have a second round. Thank you. I'm uh, Simon Long from The Economist magazine. Uh, I just wanted to um, pick up something uh, Professor Huang said and ask for others' comments on it when he said he thought that China knew it had overplayed its hand in Phnom Penh in, in July. And I just wonder about that, whether we saw the same divisions persist at the ASEAN summit and China didn't seem to do anything to play them down there, and whether the conclusion is, is that China has decided that for the time being it is better off with a weak and divided ASEAN. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing home from People's University of China and I would like to raise a question to our Vietnamese scholar and uh, because according to a lot of Western medias and a lot of Chinese medias is saying that Vina and is pursuing and the United States is pursuing some strategic building up some strategic partnership between Hanoi and Washington. And uh, I would like to ask you to elaborate this kind of development. Yes, the question. Thank you very much. This is Gunnar Özkan from International Strategic Research Organization from Ankara from Turkey. Um, I would like to ask a question for uh, Mr. Ambassador from Myanmar. And your country has opened up in democratic terms and economic terms and developing um, intensive and good relations with the US and the EU first. And, um, and also your country has uh, good relations with China. Uh, I would like to ask how much this democratic opening will be reflected in the minority problem in your country, which is happening with the Rahonda Muslims in, in your country, and how much China will play in that role, because we know that China has uh, minority problems as well. Will that uh, Myanmar follow the example of China, or dealing more and giving more freedom and dealing with the problems of the current minority crisis in the country as Western world would ask. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll just stop right here now and then we will have the panelists here. Yeah? Please, Professor uh, Huang. Yes, I, from, uh, from scholars' point of view, I, I do think China overplayed its hand in July, especially when only one country how the other nine countries uh, the, in the kind of joint statement. I, I also believe that Chinese leadership should have realized that. That's why you, you see Yang Jiechi and Fu Xin went back to the region to talk to various countries. Um, uh, having said that, in the long run, 
uh, I don't think China is going to back down South China Sea. That's a reality. Let's be realistic. If you were leaders in Beijing, you're sitting there, you basically look at three major factors on South China Sea. The first factor, will China continue to grow or China become weaker? That is time on which side? The China Sea, time on its side, the China is getting bigger and bigger. And number two, will all those countries, not ASEAN, just four countries, Clement, united as one against China? The answer is very unlikely. And the third factor is that the United States really you know, put its action with the world's eye when push comes to, <laughs> to shove, and uh, the, the answer is very unlikely. So if China look at three factors, there's no reason for Chinese leader to back down, to compromise on this, especially when the nationalism is rising, because this is a domestic issue. It's not uh, just an international issue for the Chinese leaders. Uh, it's, it's in that sense we're saying that for the Chinese, how to handle South China's issue is not whether but how by what means. That's why I think there's a deep, deep-seated uh, resentment or even worry that how the United States brought this issue into public, make it a kind of international issue. And for the Chinese leaders, I think it may be better if you negotiate quietly, uh, so quiet dem diplomacy rather than challenge China high profile uh, that way. But having said all of this, I think China's South China Sea policy will be at two levels. On level, strategic level, China will took full advantage of strategic ambiguity. A big power has this kind of advantage, just look at the United States. That is, China will see all the water within the nine dash lines mine. But if you ask China which part is yours, and China will say only the islands and the surrounding water. That's the best answer you can get from China. But on the uh, uh, tactical uh, level, China will two lines. Two cents. Number one, multilateralism for joint development or cooperation, and bilateralism to seek a solution or at least the management of the issue. I think that will be China's approach for a long time to come. Mm. Um, I understand, you know, there has always been, or uh, there has always been a concern from China, you know, when China's neighbors, you know, improve relations, you know, with the countries that, you know, uh, China is worried most, you know. So the same thing, you know, happened to me when I first visited China in 1995 before Vietnam normalized relations you know, with uh, uh, the United States before Vietnam joined ASEAN. And I met people you know, from various institutions in China, and they said that, please uh, do not normalize relations with the U.S. Please do not join ASEAN. ASEAN is an anti-China organization, and the U.S. You know, is uh, also against China. So I think that you know, there, has all, uh, there, has, there is you know, a legitimate concern you know, from China when we improve relations with the United States. And we see that, you know, since the past 20 years, there has been much improvement in the relations between Vietnam and China, between Vietnam and the U.S. But our relation with the U.S., you know, has been no way or is by no way compared to uh, relations between China and the United States. So there is no much, you know, foundations for you to concern about the improvement of our relations with the U.S. You know. <laughs> so you have more than 60 channels, you know, to manage the relation with the U.S. We have only, you know, several channels, you know, less than 10, or fewer than 10, you know. So, uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, if I could, uh, Vietnam has eight formal strategic partnerships. It started the first one with the Soviet Union. It then did India, Japan, China, Republic of Korea, Spain, Germany, and the UK. And then it raised Germany. its... Germany, I put, yeah, Germany, yeah. yeah. It, it raised its relations with China to comprehensive strategic partners. So one, the question should be, why is it a special relationship with China versus strategic <laughs> partnerships with all the rest, although Russia was changed? Next year, they'll announce strategic partnership with Italy and France. Uh, the one with the U.S. is still being negotiated. It's hung up with human rights and where, where that should go. Uh, the answer is, I, try, I gave a presentation of Vietnam. Is it members of the UN Security Council? Yes, but not the US and France. Is it members of the G20? Yes, but why Spain, which is not a member of the G20? Is it the major powers in East Asia and South Asia? Yes, but not all. It's Vietnam's policy of multilateralizing and diversifying its external relations, of which the United States is just one of several great powers. And also China is, you know, has a special relationship with Vietnam. When China you know, have only three good relations with Southeast Asian countries, you know, good friend, good partner, good neighbors, you know, but with Vietnam they have one more good, good complete. Okay. 
Good comment. <laughs> so there are always two channels of China uh, uh, Vietnam relationship. One is a government to government. We know that if that does not work, then party to party. So uh, <laughs> that's very complicated, I think. Um, that's how I learned when I was in Hanoi. Ambassador Xuan yes. on Vietnam. Thank you. I would will, I will like to answer to that question raised by our colleague over there. Uh, actually, uh, China wants to have stable, they want to see stable borders along the china Myanmar border because it is very long, 2,400 kilometers. If the border is not stable, it can affect uh, on the Chinese side also. But uh, they have never been directly involved in our national reconciliation efforts with those uh, ethnic groups. Of course, China has facilitated, they have given a place at the border, border town of Shueli, where the Kachin and our uh, government officials have met. But in answer to the, question, the other question, whether we are using some Western model or, you know, Western... So, in fact, there is. Uh, there is a group called the International Crisis Management Group, and it is headed by Norway. And, of course, there are also other uh, Western countries like Australia, uh, Britain, they are also in, and the UN, they are involved. And with this group, we have managed to uh, get in touch with uh, 10 other major ethnic armed groups. And we have already had ceasefires with them. And now uh, we are going to the next stage, which is a political talks. And the other question about the situation in the West is uh, it's not a problem of armed groups. It's a tension between the uh, two communities. That, of course, we are handling uh, in uh, our own way in domestically, and uh, we are not accepting any I mean, United Nations mediation or other, other countries. I hope it answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. I, Would you like can that? I, yes. Can I make, make a comment? Uh, for me, that uh, my... In my point of view, to divide uh, ASEAN, even in the South China Sea issue, uh, is not to China's interest. And since when we're dealing with South, South China Sea issue, there are different layers of uh, uh, problems. One is uh, uh, the territorial issue. For China, to dealing with China, uh, territorial issues is direct negotiations uh, among all the disputant countries. And for other issues, that's why, uh, like uh, um, um, marine environment protection or protection of uh, navigation, all these, they can cooperate with uh, not only the, the, uh, the disputing countries to the, south, to, the, to the features, but also other countries in the region to promote uh, uh, good governance over, over the sea. So different layers, that's why and like managing the issue is very important, not only for China, for the disputants, and for the region. So I just wanted to add that point. Because China, I agree, China would like a compliant ASEAN. A journalist who attended the Phnom Penh summit told me that Chinese diplomats privately were quite derisive about the so-called ASEAN consensus, uh, arguing it was a consensus of two, just the Philippines and Vietnam forcing everybody else behind it. So it's an ASEAN that's compliant with China, is in China's interest, but an ASEAN with which parts stand up to China's interest is not. And that's, I think, when China plays hardball. And I indicated Madame Fu Ying was in the remarks on Scarborough Shoal and what's acceptable about internationalizing the issue. I think it's putting, showing the true face of what China feels about ASEAN countries that stand up to what they perceive as their own interests. Uh, can I add one thing? <laughs> yeah. and also, okay. And uh, uh, just recently we held a workshop uh, in, in, in my city and uh, one participant uh, asked uh, about the July, uh, July uh, meeting and asked the Cambodian uh, participant saying, uh, do ASEAN pro-China or pro, pro other parties or pro uh, the US? They answered, we, uh, he answered, we e uh, echo the, what uh, Shihanuk has uh, said, pro-Cambodian. So each country is acting in whatever issues to their own interest. That's the point I, I wanted. Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> the, the, du the duty of the ASEAN chair is to promote ASEAN unity. And for, I was leaked and I published the article, 30 pa it's 30 pages long, a document of a minister's notes of the ASEAN ministerial retreat. And I waited a decent interval before publishing it. So we know exactly what word for word 
by one minister what was being said. And this is at the retreat after the communique was drafted and presented by the four drafting parties and all 10 ministers gave their interventions. Cambodia ended it after every 10 ministers, nine ministers said, no, can't, no communique. Then a debate uh, erupted. That's why I've identified the five countries in ASEAN who persistently, but they didn't attack the chair, ASEAN is the, Cambodia is the chair, for its behavior. They kept finding an alternative. When that meeting ended, there were 18 drafts between Monday and Friday that were presented to Cambodia, and it rejected them. In other words, we, we ran out of the English language thesaurus of words to describe the area, the South China Sea, Scarborough Shoal, exclusive economic zones, no continental shelf, rejected, rejected, rejected. And so it's, in a sense, whether it's China's client or a client that knows what China wants and overplayed the hand isn't the point. It didn't play the role of ASEAN chair in getting consensus. Uh, there always has been an ability. And these 18 drafts all had the agreement of the Philippines and Vietnam, meaning that they certainly were willing to play ball on this. So we can't, uh, China, you know, they overplayed its hand. We can't totally blame China. Cambodia had its own interest. It gets rewarded for that behavior. Uh, and that makes it, I think, difficult for then ASEAN to work on a code of conduct or anything further, and China knows that. So I just, I think that's important to know. Yeah, I want to make one point that I think China is a big country, Russian country, has to be very careful when dealing with ASEAN. That is, when ASEAN make any decision, it is because ASEAN wants to make this decision. It's not because ASEAN made the decision under the pressure of China. I think ASEAN would be very, very resented if the outside perceive ASEAN as kind of uh, soft knee uh, on China's pressure. That's why this uh, Feng Ben uh, episode uh, was so, in my view, uh, bad for China's long-term interest. Mm -hmm. When I mean China overplayed its hand because they sent a, a message to the whole world that ASEAN can twist the arms of ASEAN to make some decision, and then that is something I think China as a big power should try to avoid. Uh, I would also like to add that you know, because of the failure of the, uh, the non-issuance, the statement you know, on the ASEAN side. So everyone you know, did not only look at Cambodia, they look at China. They saw that you know, because of China, whether China intended to do it or not, you know, but they saw that you know, it was China. That is one thing. The second thing is that because of the South China Sea issue, why China you know, was so strongly against the South China Sea issue. It should very much be important for China. So that is why there has even been more attention on South China Sea issue on China you know, after the failure of the issue on the system. Thank you. We open up again. Yes. Well, sorry about that. No, no, no problem. <laughs> I would like to ask a, a simple question it's for all the panelists. Suppose you were in uh, Ho Jintao or, or Xi Jinping's position, what would you do? <laughs> okay, one over there. Zhang Zixin from uh, Shanghai Institute for International Studies. Uh, two short questions about uh, ASEAN inter integration. Uh, one for Professor Dyer. Uh, you mentioned econ economic concerns were the first driver before over the past two decades for ASEAN integration. Right now, there's a growing concern, growing impetus for ASEAN to develop other pillars of its integration, and most importantly, it's a political military pillar. So how how possible do you think uh, ASEAN is going to achieve that in the next three years before the deadline comes? And one related question to uh, uh, Professor uh, Huang. Uh, many Western, some, some Western think tanks propose that uh, it is time that ASEAN give up the pathway of this loose integration and focus on more uh, closed, uh, enforced leadership by giving up this rotating chairmanship and uh, let uh, more responsible stronger countries like Singapore and uh, Indonesia to take the chairmanship. Uh, how would you comment on that? Thank you. <laughs> I can tell you that's no go. <laughs> Anyone? Third question? No? Okay. Right over there. Yes, Brad. Brad Glosserman, Pacific Forum. Um, 
Maybe two questions. The first one is, is 20 years ago, as ASEAN was contemplating uh, absorbing the CMLV countries, particularly when it came to Myanmar, the case that was made by the ASEAN governments was that we needed to bring Myanmar in to ensure that it was not subjected to the influence of other malign regional actors, i.e. it was a counterbalance to China. So I'm wondering to what degree do the changes in Myanmar change strategic balances within Southeast Asia and, and, and relations with China? Um, and second, I guess, if we have real qu- I promise very quickly, Stephen. Um, for Professor Huang, I think your comment about rebalancing was misdirected. I don't think it's rebalancing against anyone. No, I don't mean that. I mean that people perceive as that. Okay, good it's clarification. Not- but you talk about U.S. alliances, and particularly in Northeast Asia. And what I would ask is there are two U.S. allies within Southeast Asia as well. So what is the perception within ASEAN of the role of those alliances? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, we've already later. Yes. Please. Okay. okay, if I could be Xi Jinping, you want us to answer now? Yes. Well, if I could be Xi Jinping, I'd, I'd do several things. First, the, the central government in China has been woeful about controlling the nine dragons, the various bureaucracies at provincial and local level that have been running amok in the South China Sea. So one is to, to re retry again to bring central control over a small leading group, which he heads anyway, over these bureaucracies to make sure they're all online. Two, China should clarify what it means by the nine-dash line. Philippines has been exemplary in in redoing its baselines, uh, giving up the Kalayan Island groups as that that, that huge charge. And we need clarification, and we don't need our obfuscation that it's indisputable sovereignty. That's a mistranslation. It's disputable sovereignty that that China is claiming, and that would greatly help. So those those are the the two things. And then I'd say I'd move on uh, with a code of conduct. But uh, and I'll, if I could, then answer the question directly related to me. The three pillars that ASEAN is setting up a ASEAN community by 2015 of three pillars. It's political security community, not military, and then economic and social cultural. And they're all to proceed in tandem. It's the end of 2015. The ASEAN defense ministers met, I think, for the first time in 2006, and that was the last sectoral, last ministerial group of all the ASEAN countries to meet. That has not, and it brought under its, once they met, a, a hierarchy of senior officials and then the chiefs of Army, Navy, Air Force, and Intelligence. So we now have a reporting body. <clears throat> but they also realized they didn't have complete wherewithal, so they expanded that to the plus by bringing in eight of their ten dialogue partners to assist in that development. And the ADMM Plus has set up expert working groups that are co-chaired. Now, one way out of the code of conduct in the South China Sea is the fact that the expert working group on, on maritime security, headed by Malaysia and Australia, has borrowed protocols that pre-exist from the Western Pacific Naval Symposium on rules of the road, which are not Cold War incidents at sea agreement, but set up good seamanship to prevent kinds of incidents. It's value-free. It predates the South China Sea disputes. And if that percolates up and gets accepted, we could now have an agreed rules of the road, of which China's an observer has seen at the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. So I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Well, as you, you know, that's where ASEAN should move by supporting it, and that would be the fourth thing for Xi Jinping to do would be to accept them. <laughs> would others like to comment on or respond to the question of what would you do if you were Hu Jintao? Yeah. Right. No, Xi Jinping. I'm afraid of Hu Jintao yesterday. <laughs> To understand, maybe you think the other way. Uh, it's difficult to, uh, to, to tell what Xi Jinping will do because nobody is him. But it may be easier to think what Xi Jinping will not do on the South China Sea. And then see that. I think first Xi Jinping will not publicly back down on the South China Sea territory dispute because that's a su- suicidal. He will never do that, especially when China is openly challenged. And second, Xi Jinping will not allow China to enter into any multilateral negotiation on territory dispute. Not what Xi Jinping will not do. And number three, Xi Jinping will not allow PLA, whoever, to open the first shot on the South China issue. Because China is big enough, just use the belly, peacefully, you know, push f- forward. <laughs> and, and, uh, but then having said that, I think what China, Xi Jinping will do and might do is that Xi Jinping might take issues differently. For example, when China talks with the Filipinos, 
I think it's easy because 90% of Philippines' claim of the energy field is within the West Bank, is outside the Nantash Line, and the Philippines doesn't have a fishery industry. So it's much easier to negotiate with the Philippines for deal. I was in Philippines, I talked with some policymakers there in July, and I think that China Philippines uh, negotiations went well. But the problem is with Vietnam, because Vietnam, not only Vietnam has 75% uh, of <coughs> Vietnam's energy field is within the Nantash Line, and the fishery industry, just like China and Taiwan, is very important for Vietnam's economy. And also, Xi Jinping may also take something, for example, Malaysia, as an example. Malaysia has over 900 whales all in the Nantash Line, but Malaysia never stand up, so-called stand up challenge uh, uh, China's uh, sovereignty. So therefore, China could say, look, look at Malaysia and Brunei, so on and so forth. But having said all of that, I think it is against China's interests, number one, to use South China Sea as a leverage against anyone, especially the United States, because the United States does have vital interest in the peace in the region. And number two, China should not self-create an image as a big bully against the small countries. China should always emphasize peaceful solution. And number three, I think China should come back to a COC negotiation. Because COC is not a solution. COC is all about management mm -hmm. to prevent a tension, any tension escalating in the crisis. I think it's a big mistake for China to refuse to come back to the negotiation table on COC issue. And any, on, the, on, the, on the question for this gentleman about U.S. alliance in the region, how the region look at it. Number one region, uh, most of countries privately are very disappointed because uh, uh, Hillary and uh, uh, Panetta, whoever, come in to make a big high-profile issue on South China Sea in 2009, 2010, and then, but privately, the United States tell all those countries <laughs> we don't take side, or openly. So, look, for example, I was told that uh, uh, our president, I mean, President Obama told one president of the country said, if you fire first shot, I'm walking. And this kind of language is very disappointing. And uh, let, let them, but of course, from a United States point of view, I understand we don't want to give anyone a blank check. Uh, that's very important. But having said that, I think two important issues, very important, I think United States took ne take note. No, you said United States are two allies in the region, but none of them want to see this alliance being against any third party, especially ASEAN. In other words, ASEAN said alliance is a bilateral alliance. If you want against a third party, then I don't think ASEAN can go very well with that. That's the first issue. And second issue, of course, United States should not and cannot use these bilateral alliances to get involved into ASEAN's business. Be very careful with the fine line over there. Okay, one last question, please, Professor. Yes. We're running out of time, and I'd like to save at least half a minute for each to In conclude. fact, my question is just uh, some you know, supplement to my colleague, Shanghai colleague, Professor Zeng's question. And suppose Yahoo, Xi Jinping, and especially Professor you know, uh, Huang Jing, and uh, what kind of advice and you will give to Xi Jinping and to you know, very nice to association countries especially those disputed with China, with South China Sea, but at the same time, to persuade China public opinion, to persuade the forces within China to accept this kind of policy. If I were give uh, advice to Xi Jinping, actually I did something already. Uh, three things I think China should do. Number one, like I said, go back to the negotiation table, or COC, seriously. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a management, uh, it's not for solution. And uh, that's first. And second, I think China as a big country should make an announcement that China will not use force uh, very openly, at least not fire the first shot. And the last but not the least, I think China should try to avoid repeating the kind of play uh, last July, try to enforce its will upon ASEAN as a whole especially use one country against nine. That it was, I think, that was a very a big mistake. China should avoid doing that again. My question is how he sells this to China public opinion? That is Xi Jinping's problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay, friends, we only have half a minute each for presenter to round up, okay? Because it's time on it. Please, Huang, from your side, if you have any. Oh, uh, there are three reasons you know, why ASEAN is united you know, on South China Sea issues. One is that you know, 
the uh, uh, there is a fear that is now uh, a fear of the integrity of the international law issue. Uh, the second issue is now is about the relationship between uh, big and small and medium-sized countries. Now, if China can interpret you now uh, one one thing, you know, they can do the other thing. And a third thing is you now is about the core interests of ASEAN. That is unity. That is why ASEAN is so united you know, on this issue. I think the role of external powers needs to be put in perspective. After all, a year ago at the East Asia Summit, among 18 countries, two were quiet, Cambodia, Myanmar. One opposed the discussion of the other 15 countries on maritime issues. So 16 of 18 countries raised maritime issues. Uh, it, it was important. Uh, Chinese like to point to July two years ago when Hillary Clinton spoke. Seven other foreign ministers joined her. It wasn't exactly that she just, you know, they blame it all on America. So there's substantial reasonable support for a U.S. balancing role, but not one that upsets ASEAN centrality. What hasn't been emphasized here today is, of course, that Pr President Obama has, has moved into a supporting position, that initially when Hillary Clinton offered a collaborative role, Assistant Secretary Campbell said in, in an interview shortly after, quite frankly, nobody wants the United States to play that role, and it's backed off, and it's just got the kudos from ASEAN. And whether the U.S. and, uh, should, and ASEAN should discuss, well, the, sec the fourth leaders meeting uh, issued their communique, and they did discuss the South China Sea, and they had no problems putting that in the wording. So the U.S. is seen by ASEAN through these leaders meetings as a legitimate player in regional security. Ambassador Xian. I think uh, South China Sea should not uh, uh, hold ASEAN as a hostage. You know, we have many other uh, important relations with China, especially in the economic. And so I think uh, while working on this, we should also try to uh, do other things much more important than this. That would be my opinion. Dr. Lee. Yeah. Um, in regard, I go back also to the South China Sea issue. Although South China Sea issue is not the uh, is not the important uh, issue between China and ASEAN, but it certainly could be a disturbing uh, factor. So managing the uh, the disputes is key and important for the peace and stability of the region. And uh, during the past uh, developments, uh, du during the dis dis developments during the past years. Uh, it's seemingly there's a lack of confidence uh, in, in this region, in the South China Sea region, among the disputing countries. So building confidence, building trust is very key for the future. I think China's uh, relationship with ASEAN uh, improved dramatically after 1997-1998. And uh, I think that's the foundation, that is economic integration and mutual beneficial relationship is a solid foundation between China and ASEAN. I think China should continue to do that first. And second is that China should be very careful not to give people impression that China uses big power, try to enforce its own ideas, its standing onto ASEAN. Be very careful not to do that. And number three, I think China should really do something, but just not talking about it, really do something to show China's willingness and capability to promote uh, you know, a mutual benefit uh, sense, for example, on the, all the water project. A Mekong project and also Myanmar because that really matters and I think China has a capability and it should also have the willingness to promote this kind of uh, a real, uh, situation in which using China's jargon, the win-win situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, in closing this session, before we meet for the plenary, the uh, China-Southeast Asia relationship focusing on South China Sea, we all know, very complex as complex as the other territorial disputes. And that's going to take time. But the great need is that no matter what, we consult one another, we meet, we discuss. Because the, the moment we stop meeting and discussing, then all kinds of misunderstandings will arise and then each will go one way and it's in no benefit to any of the parties concerned. From what I gather here, uh, discussion now that it is important for China as a big power dealing with small countries because it's not just China and ASEAN. China's image, global image, is at stake also. And uh, it would be to China's advantage for ASEAN to be able to come together, unite, so that it can be 
an entity by itself looking after its interests, but open to have positive relations with all the major powers. So looking at China and ASEAN and South China Sea, it doesn't look like it's just bipartisan. China and Southeast Asia. Somehow, with the other major powers, the South China Sea issue is also China, ASEAN, and the U.S. in particular, uh, with ASEAN caught in the middle. We can continue this tomorrow when we have network session on that. Please join me in thanking our presenters for expressing your views. We will now have a 15-minute break. The second plenary session, China in Northeast Asia, will begin in the Orchid Room at 5.15. Thank you.